Hey everyone, so glad to welcome you to our online campus today. We're glad to have you joining us for worship. If you got a Bible, go ahead and turn it to John chapter 13 and just hold that ready for a few minutes. This weekend we begin a very brief two-week sermon series called Better Together. It's that time of year when we encourage everyone to get connected to a small group, so that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, this series titled Better Together reminded me of something that I read a while back that was simply called, How Do You Decide Who to Marry? And that question, along with a few others, was posed to a group of children who gave their answers. The first question, of course, was how do you decide who to marry? Alan, age 10, said, you've got to find someone who likes the same stuff. Like if you like sports, she should like sports, and she should keep the chips and dip coming. Kirsten, age 10, said, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. Another question was, uh, what's the right age to get married? Camille, age 10, said, 23 is the best age because you know that person forever by then. Question number three was, how can a stranger tell if two people are married? Derek, age 8, answered like this, you might have to, get, to guess based on whether or not they seem to be yelling at the same kids. Number four, what do your mom and dad have in common? Lori, age 8, said, both don't want any more kids. Number five, what do most people do on a date? Martin, age 10, said on the first date, they just tell each other lies, and that usually gets them interested enough to go for a second date. Question number six was, what would you do on a first date that was turning sour? And Craig, age nine, said, I'd run home and play dead. The next day, I would call all the newspapers and make sure they wrote about me in all the dead columns. Question number seven, when is it okay to kiss someone? And Pam, age seven, and I think she might be on to something here, said, when they're rich. The final question was, how would you make a marriage work? And Ricky, age 10, said, tell your wife she looks pretty, even if she looks like a truck. Well, we do have a new sermon series coming up in just a couple of weeks called uh, Faith and Family. So... I need to remember some of those things on the weekend that I talk about marriage. Uh, but this weekend, we're talking about a different kind of better together. This week, we're talking about spiritual friendships, the kind you form when you're connected to other believers in a personal way. And I got to be honest and tell you that I didn't feel a whole lot of excitement about this sermon series, even though I'm the one who has complete control over the preaching calendar and what we talk about. And here's why I say that. I'm sure you've heard or read that definition of insanity that was attributed to Albert Einstein who said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. I kind of feel that way about our small groups every year. Every year we spend time teaching and encouraging and challenging you all from God's word. It's not just personal opinion, directly from God's word to understand and embrace the value of being connected to other believers in small groups. Small groups are a significant part of what we call our core four strategy here. That's the strategy we employ to live out our vision and our mission. Our, our, our core four strategy is compelling worship. That's what we do on the weekend. Relational discipleship, spiritual influence, and serving others across the street and around the world. And so in that relational discipleship strategy, we simply believe that people grow best, and I'm talking about spiritual growth, people grow best in community with others. And yet every year, more of you choose not to participate than those who do. So it was a little difficult to get excited about this series. It felt maybe a little too close to that definition of insanity. But then ultimately, I, I do what I always do because it's not just a... It's not just about getting connected in a small group that sometimes seems frustrating in terms of getting people to respond. Um, I just do what I always do. And I come to the place where I realize, well, you know what? Maybe this year will be different. Maybe this will be the year that makes the difference for some people. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about what Jesus teaches us about the importance of personal relationships, the kind of personal relationships that happen in a small group based on his own small group experience. Several years ago, I was in my office and I was trying to write a funeral message. A woman, a wonderful woman in our church had died and what I wanted to communicate in the funeral message was the depth of love that she had for her family and other people who were important to her in her life. 
And as I was thinking about it, I started thinking about John chapter 13 and the story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. So if you've got your Bible open to John chapter 13, I want you to look with me there beginning in verse 1 and follow along as I read down through verse 15. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. We'll stop right there. Now, as I read that story, thinking about that funeral message, something stood out to me that I had really never noticed or thought much about before. It's right there in the first verse, so we'll put that verse back up on the screen. This is how the chapter begins. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, and here it is in this last phrase. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And of course, Jesus did that by washing their feet. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples on Thursday night of the last week of his life. He is hours away from being arrested and his death is imminent. Let me ask you a question as we begin. If you knew that your death was imminent, that you only had days or even hours to live, how would you spend that time? I'm sure every one of us would answer in the same way. We would spend the last days and the last hours of our lives making sure we said and did the most important things for the people that we love the most. We would leave no words unspoken. And that's exactly what Jesus did with his disciples. And listen, friends, what Jesus did in the last days and hours of his life was so significant that when John wrote his gospel, the gospel of John, where we just read the story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, when John wrote his gospel, he devoted five chapters just to the last night of Jesus' life. There are 21 chapters in the gospel of John. One half of John's gospel is dedicated to the last week of Jesus' life, and five chapters are dedicated to the last night of his life. And what Jesus was very careful and purposeful to do and to say on that last night of his life gives us some powerful and convicting reasons why we need to be connected to people in our lives. And I'm not talking about casual connections. I'm talking about deep connections. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you five reasons that can be gleaned from the last night of Jesus' life. One for each of the chapters that John writes about or John uses, rather, to write about the last night of Jesus' life, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. I'm going to do this quickly. If you're someone who likes to take notes, you write down next to number one this first thing. We need deep connections so we can, and here it is, number one, serve one another. So we can serve one another. Listen again to the last part of John 13, 1. Having loved his own who were in the world... He now showed them the full extent of his love. And Jesus did that by getting up from the meal that he was sharing with his disciples, taking off his outer clothing, wrapping a towel around his waist, and washing their feet. Jesus is getting ready to die. He knew that. And so he wanted to do something that would make a lasting impression on the people that were closest to him. 
Have you ever been to a foot washing ceremony? Uh, that's something that I haven't been to in a long time, but I've done it a handful of times over my life. That's something that's done sometimes in special church services. Sometimes couples will make a foot washing ceremony a part of their wedding ceremony to give a sign of their servant-like commitment to each other. But here's the deal, regardless of the setting, when we do foot washing ceremonies today, it's pretty much just a symbolic thing. I'm not saying that to minimize it in any way, but to emphasize that foot washing in Jesus' day was anything but symbolic. It was real. People walked the dry and dirty roads of Israel in sandals, and their feet just, they, they weren't just dirty, they were filthy. So when you went into someone's home, foot washing was necessary. And foot washing was usually relegated to the lowest of the low when it came to servants in that home. So, so, so it's no surprise that the disciples were caught off guard when Jesus got up and began to wash their feet. So much so that when he came to Simon Peter, we just read this, he said, this is John 13, 8, Peter said to Jesus, you shall never wash my feet. But in that same verse, Jesus replies by saying, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. What did Jesus mean by that? Well, I think there's some strong, some strong symbolism in those words. Uh, I mean, think of it like this. Unless Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, cleanses a person of their sin, they can't have any part with him. But beyond that symbolism, I also believe there's a practical application here. And Jesus might just be saying to Peter, listen, Peter, you need someone in your life who knows you so well that they are familiar with the filthiest and the dirtiest parts of who you are. And so here's the point. Every single one of us needs to have close enough relationships with people that we can show them or we can trust them with the deepest and dirtiest parts of our lives. Now, let's just acknowledge together how difficult that is. I mean, it's so difficult that most of us will never be comfortable or open enough to let that happen. And not only that, many of us will do just the opposite of that. And instead of letting, one see, letting someone see the depth of our struggle, we go out of our way to make it look like we've got everything together, that our life is perfect. But it's just a lie. What all of us needs to do is we need to take off the mask. See what I did there? We need to take off the mask and give someone or give a group of people the opportunity to really know us so they can serve us. You know, in the church, we're always saying, you need to serve. And that's true because the Bible teaches that. We all need to be involved in serving others. That's why one of our core four strategies is serving others across the street and around the world. But the Bible also makes it clear that sometimes we need to be served. Look at these words from 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. Peter says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. There are moments in all of our lives where we need to experience the grace of God in some tangible way. And when we allow ourselves to be known, I'm talking about being really known by others, we put ourselves in a position to be served by them when we're struggling and we need to experience the grace of God in our lives. Now, very quickly, because I've already spent too much time on this point, I want you to look back in John 13 with me for a moment, this time just at verse 15. After Jesus washes their feet and puts his clothes back on and returns to his place at the table, this is what he says to them. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Remember, it's the last night of Jesus' life, and he wants to make the most of his time, so he teaches them the importance of serving others by serving them. Listen, friends, being connected to other people in a small group will give you the opportunity to live out Jesus' example. It'll give you the opportunity to serve, not just to serve, but it'll give you the opportunity when it's needed to be served. Well, that's number one. Right down next to number two, the second thing we learn. We need deep connections so we can, here it is, number two, encourage one another. I want you to turn the page in your Bible from John 13 to John 14 and look with me for a moment just at verse one. John 14 and verse one, Jesus says, he's still with his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
Trust in God. Trust also, trust also in me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Now, the word Jesus uses for troubled there in verse 1 is the Greek word tarasso. And listen, it means all kinds of bad things. It means agitated. It means restless. It means disturbed. It describes a feeling of fear and dread. Do not let your hearts be agitated or restless or disturbed or be filled with fear and dread. Because that's the way the disciples were feeling on that night. That shouldn't surprise us because it was the last night of Jesus' life. And while the disciples should have understood more about what was happening because of the things that Jesus has already told them, he's already revealed to them what's going to happen. All they felt was a tension and a heaviness in the air. And so Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. And then, we don't have time to do it, but if you were to begin to read the rest of the chapter especially what Jesus says next, you'd see that after he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me, he begins to talk about heaven. I listened to a sermon recently where Chris Hodges from Church of the Highlands talked about this passage, and he said something that really stood out to me. He said, if you want to encourage someone who is going through a difficult time, don't tell them that life is going to get better because, you know what, it might not. Sometimes it doesn't. And I don't know about you, but it seems to me that that's more and more true with the passing of time. I mean, don't all of us feel like right now that we're living in a time when just one bad thing after another is happening? I certainly know that that's the way we feel at my house. He, go, he goes on to say, instead of just telling them that things are going to get better, and this is an exact quote from what he said. He said, tell them, that some glad morning, when this life is over, we're all going to fly away. In other words, tell them about heaven. If you were a part of our service last week, you heard me talk about how I preached a memorial service message for my nephew Kyle through a Zoom call. That was probably the most difficult message of that kind that I've ever delivered, in part because I just felt this deep level of responsibility and need to say something that was going to bring comfort and encouragement to our family who was filled with grief. But after some introductory remarks, I just told them that one of the things that I have learned over the years as a Christian and as a pastor is that there are some hurts and losses that we may never understand this side of heaven. But I went on to tell them that I've also learned that when I'm confronted with questions I can't answer or circumstances I can't understand, that's when I cling. And I'm, I mean, that's when I really cling to the things that I do know and I do, that I do understand. And so I said, this is what I know for sure today. Because Kyle had an encounter with Jesus and had given his heart to Jesus and received the grace of Jesus, I knew that he was in heaven. And if we do the same thing, then one day we'll see him again. And I said that because honestly, friends, I couldn't think of a better way to try to encourage and comfort our grieving and heartbroken family other than to tell them that their son, their brother, their grandson, their nephew, their cousin was in heaven where all things have been made new and where one day we could see him again. There are times in all of our lives when we need to be encouraged for a variety of different reasons. One of the reasons why there are times in our lives when we need to be encouraged is because when our hearts are troubled, and remember again, I told you that word means agitated, restless, disturbed, and filled with fear and dread. When our hearts are troubled, then that's when we often have the wrong kinds of thoughts. And when we have the wrong kinds of thoughts, oftentimes we make the wrong choices. I mean, think about it with me for a minute. Isn't it when your heart is troubled? Isn't it when you're agitated, restless, disturbed, or filled with fear and anger? Or not fear and anger, but fear and dread? When you look at what you're doing and you say, you know what, I just want to quit. Or I just want to give up. Or I just want some way out. I can't do this anymore. I can tell you from my own personal experience that when my heart is troubled, 
that's when I think about getting out of all of this, not being a pastor anymore, not dealing with the, the struggles and the pain of people in their lives and the pressure and on and on and on. But when we have those kinds of thoughts, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll make some huge mistakes and sometimes they're mistakes that we will regret for the rest of our lives. That's why it's so important for us to embrace encouragement. That's why it's so important for us to encourage one another, to always be willing to share a word of encouragement with each other. Look at these words from Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. The Hebrew writer says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you, listen to this, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, one of the things that happens when we're, when we're discouraged, when our hearts are troubled, is our enemy, the devil, sees that and tries to take advantage of us. And one of the ways he tries to take advantage of us, advantage of us is he tempts us and he tries to lure us into sin. But here's, we need to, here's what we need to know about sin. It will lie to you because the devil is a liar. Sin will always promise something that it cannot deliver. And so, encouragement is a powerful weapon in the lives of each of us as believers. Encouragement is one of the most powerful things that we have to offer to other people, especially when their hearts are troubled. That's what Jesus did for the, the disciples. He knew how troubled they were, and so he offered a word of encouragement. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Truett Cathy, who is the founder of Chick-fil-A once uh, was speaking to an audience of people and he asked this question, how do you identify someone who needs encouragement? He paused and then he gave the answer to his own question. He said, that person is breathing. Or in other words, we all need encouragement all the time. And being connected to a small group will give you the opportunity to encourage others, but not just encourage others. It will give you the opportunity to be encouraged as well. Don't take that lightly. Don't take that part of being connected to a small group lightly. Number three, we need deep connections so we can accomplish more. I'm going to be real quick about this. Turn the page to uh, John 15. Um, when we're connected with other people, the bottom line is we're able to accomplish more for God than we could ever accomplish on our own. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5 of John chapter 15. Uh, verses 4 and 5 say this, Remain in me, Jesus again still talking to the disciples, Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, listen, this is a powerful teaching from Jesus on the importance of being deeply connected to him. But I don't really have time to talk about that or explain that. So let me just make a single point of application here. Jesus is saying to the disciples, you can, do more than with, you can do more with me than you can do without me. In fact, he says, you can do nothing without me. And there's a truism in that that relates to what we're talking about today. And the truism is this, we can do more together than we could ever do on our own. One of the great things about a large church like Mount Pleasant is together we can accomplish some incredible things. Together we can build an impact center on the back of our campus that serves hundreds, literally hundreds of families every week. Not just physical food, but spiritual food can give people a new and a different kind of church to be a part of. Together we can, we can meet at the Community Life Center across the street on a Saturday uh, during Change the World Week and we can pack over 400,000 meals to send to our mission partner in Cuba to provide food for people in need. Together we can, we can plant a satellite campus down in the old Southside neighborhood of downtown. We can buy a building and remodel it and start reaching all kinds of people, especially people with deep, deep needs. And I could go on and on and on. We're all a part of that together, and it's important for us to understand that because we can accomplish more together. And when you connect to a small group, when you're together, deeply connected to other believers, you can do more together than you could ever do on your own. Number four, we need deep connections, and this is really an important one, friends. We need deep connections so we can, here it is, protect one another. I want you to turn the page with me to John 16 or look across the page. That's the way it is for me in my Bible to John chapter 16. And notice verse 1. 
John chapter 16 begins like this. This is verse 1. Jesus says, again, he's just with the disciples. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. Now, I need to take a minute and just give you some context. When Jesus says, all this I have told you, the all this that he is talking about is what he has just said to them in the latter part of John 15, in particular, John chapter 15, verses 18 through 25. Now, I don't have time to read it, so every one of you needs to read that on your own today. I'll summarize it like this. In that passage, John 15, 18 through 25, he basically talks about the danger of living in a world that hates him. The world hates Jesus. And he's warning them to not let the hatred of the world for him cause them, to use his words, to go astray. It's that word astray that I want to focus on for a minute. In the original language of the New Testament, the word astray is the Greek word skandalizo. Skandalizo. And if you were to look it up in the Greek lexicon, it means to entice to sin or fall away. It means to cause a person to begin to distrust and desert one whom he ought to trust and obey. But let me give you a really practical definition for the Greek word skandalizo, which again is translated astray in John 16, 1, where Jesus says, All this I have told you, so that you will not go astray. It means a snare in your path that you cannot see. And so when Jesus says, all this I've told you so that you will not go astray, he said, all this I've told you so that you will not be caught in a snare in your path that you can't see. Something in front of you that for whatever reason can harm you. Something dangerous in front of you that you can't see. Let me tell you something that anyone with any level of real life experience can agree with. There are snares in our path everywhere we go. And you, listen, you just need to trust me on this because I've got a lot of years of experience listening to people in the churches that I've served say something like this when they've fallen into that snare or some kind of snare. I can't believe I did that or I can't believe I let my guard down or I can't believe I was so stupid or something like that. There have been moments like that in my life when I walked right into something that for whatever reason I didn't see and it caused me pain or it caused pain for other people and I felt horrible when it was over. You know, there are multiple words in the New Testament that are translated sin, which oftentimes that's what the snare is that's in front of us. It's it's a temptation to sin or an opportunity to sin. The most common Greek word translated sin is the Greek word hamartia, which literally means to miss the mark. That's probably the one, if you've been in church any length of time, that you've heard more than any other. But another one of the Greek words translated sin in the Bible is the word paraptama. Paraptama. And it basically means to miss your step. I mean, the, 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 the formal definition Uh, in the Greek lexicon is a lapse or deviation from truth and uprightness, but on the most practical level, it means to miss your step. Now, let me just talk about that for a minute. Uh, I'm sure every one of us has the experience of walking up or down a stairway, and if you're walking up or downstairs, if you're walking upstairs and you don't pick your foot up high enough and it gets caught on the step in front of you, what do you do? You immediately go down. We all, especially living here in central Indiana, we all have experience with having times when we have to walk on ice, ice ice-covered parking lots or driveways or sidewalks or something like that. And when we're doing that, we try to be as careful as we can, but there are times when we misstep and we slip and fall, and that's kind of the idea here. It's the idea that you didn't go out looking to sin Just like no one goes to a stairway and looks to trip and fall, just like no one goes out and walks on the sidewalk or the driveway at their home when it's covered with ice, looking to slip and fall. It's just that you let your guard down or you had some kind of a blind spot or you just stopped paying attention. You didn't have any safeguards or boundaries in place. Now listen to me 
really closely because I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. It's no less a sin. It's no less an act of disobedience. But what's really sad and disappointed with regard to this word for sin is it didn't have to happen. You, for whatever reason, just didn't recognize the danger. You just weren't careful enough in your life. And this is another reason why we need to be deeply connected with people who love and care about us because oftentimes they will be able to see what we can't see for ourselves. They will be able to see the danger that we, for whatever reason, can't see. And then they can come alongside of us because they love us and care about us and say, hey, listen, I'm concerned about you and this relationship. I don't think this relationship is good or or I'm concerned about this relationship you're having with a, a co-worker of the opposite sex or I'm concerned about the amount of time you're spending with people who have things in their lives that can maybe lead you astray, can maybe influence you if you're not being the influencer. They can say, I'm concerned about the way you're spending your time. I'm concerned about what you're watching on television or what you're looking at on the internet or on and on and on. The bottom line is friends like that can protect us. That's why we need a lot of deeply honest friends who are willing to say difficult things to us and who are willing to have awkward conversations because they love us. Now, if you don't have anyone like that in your life, if you're not willing to allow someone like that in your life, then let me tell you today, you've got a problem. And it may just be a matter of time until you slip and fall. Look at these words from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. We need someone, we need people in our lives who can help us when we fall. But we also need people in our lives who can keep us from falling, help keep us from falling. And that can happen when you're connected to a small group of believers, a small group of friends who really love and care about you. One last thing, number five, real quickly. We need deep connections so we can pray for one another. And now we find ourselves turning the page to John 17. Now, I'm going to do this quickly. If you look at your Bible and the 17th chapter of John, I'm sure you'll see that there are three separate chapter headings. Uh, Jesus prays for himself, Jesus prays for the disciples, and then something like Jesus prays for the world or Jesus prays for all believers, something like that. But I want you to focus with me for just a moment on John chapter 17 and verse 9. After Jesus prays for himself in the first part of the chapter, he turns his attention to the disciples. And one of the things that he says, this is John 17, 9, is I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for, for those you have given me, for they are yours. And so one of the last things Jesus did before he was arrested is he prays for his disciple. He prays for his small group. He prays for the men who were closest to him. You know, I feel overwhelmed at times by the sheer number of people who need prayer. And while I do my best, I can't pray for everyone, not by name. But that shouldn't stop me from praying. I got an email this week, just like everyone else on staff did, with some names of people who were battling cancer or recovering from surgery, and I prayed for each of those people by name. I can pray for our elders by name, as they are the spiritual overseers of this church. I can pray for my staff by name, and there's not a day that goes by when I don't pray for everyone in my family, my immediate family, by name. We need to pray for each other. But let me take that a step further. We need to be engaged and connected closely and intimately to a group of people in a way that allows us to pray up close and personal prayers for them that are deeply honest. I'm going to put a verse of scripture up on the screen, James chapter 5 and verse 16, that just challenges and pierces my heart every time I read it. James writes and says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And that pierces my heart because it reminds me that God expects us to have those kinds of friendships and those kinds of connections in our lives. But you can't do that in just a random way. You, you need people that you are routinely, consistently together with, and that's what happens when you get connected to a small group. 
Well, I'm out of time, so I need to close. What Jesus is teaching us basically in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 is that we are better together. In every way, we're better together. Together. Now, you're going to have the opportunity here in the not-too-distant future to get connected to a small group if you're not already connected. And while I can't sit here and tell you exactly <coughs> excuse me, what that's going to look like, this year, as we continue to make our way through this COVID-19 virus, as we try to get on the other side of it, I can tell you this. Jesus is our ultimate example when it comes to the power and importance of community. And we do grow better together in community. That's why we embrace what we call relational discipleship here at Mount Pleasant. And you, I don't care who you are. I don't care what age you are, what season of life you're in. You need people in your life to help you continue to become the man or the woman that God wants you to be. And the flip side of that is this. There are people who need you in their life to help them continue to become the man or the woman that God wants them to be. And so, for all of these reasons, my strong encouragement to you is that you will get connected to a small group so you can discover the meaning of what it looks like to be better together. Let me just close with this quote from C.S. Lewis that I find intriguing. He says, friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, you too? I thought I was the only one. Listen, you're not the only one who feels afraid or anxious or lonely. You're not the only one who deals with depression. You're not the only one who struggles in a dysfunctional family. You're not the only one who feels abandoned. You're not the only one who struggles with sin. You're not the only one who, listen, just fill in the blank, whatever it might be. I guarantee you, you're not the only one. So why not put yourself in a position to be connected to other people who you can relate to and who can relate to you, who you can grow with and who you can help grow so that we can all become everything that God wants us to be. I want you to pray with me. Father, thank you for this time and I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would really challenge all of our hearts to understand the value of deep connections for all the reasons that Jesus has demonstrated in these last chapters of the Gospel of John. Help this to be the year when many people will say, I'm going to do it. This year I'm going to do it. We are, so, we are so scattered and separated and lonely and isolated and, and anxious. Right now, more than any other time that I can remember, we need people in our lives. And I pray that many, many people will take advantage of the opportunity to get connected to other people through the ministry of relational discipleship here at Mount Pleasant, through the small group ministry, and that it will be one of the greatest blessings of their life. Thank you that Jesus modeled this for us. We pray that Jesus would challenge us in his name. Amen.